Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Spring 2021 Room 2 Fourth Session Writing Retreat. We have Dr. Alan Karras, Transforming Failure into Success. Dr. Karras, it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me. I really... Are you okay, Dr. Cross? Oh, yes, I, I, I think there is an echo. I, I still heard you speaking. All right, uh, nope, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Okay, good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining this session. I'm really looking forward to um, sharing some insights with you on success and failure. Yes, Chris? No one's speaking, Dr. Cross. Okay, sorry. I, again, there must be some sort of um, uh, unusual stuff going on with the network because um, I know I can hear you speaking. I will just carry on. So again, um, sorry about that. Thank you for joining us for um, this afternoon session on su success and failure. Um, I look forward to sharing some of my insights with you and there'll be time at the end for um, questions. So um, I am the Dean of Libraries here at CSU. I've been here for about a year and a half. Um, I'm also an ethnomusicologist. So um, I have graduate degrees in both library science and ethnomusicology, which is the intersection of music and anthropology. So namely, I'm looking at interested, I'm looking at, um, you know, the, the people who make music and um, what does music making in a culture tell us about both the music and the culture. So more specifically, I study music festivals in the North African country of Tunisia. I completed my PhD in 2014 after completing two master's degrees. So I've spent a lot of time in graduate school. Um, so I became interested in the topic of success and failure after a failed documentary product and, uh, production in um, about 10 years ago. So it was 2011. Um, and what I'd like to do with you is, is just share a little bit of my documentary with you. So as I talk about this project, you have a point of reference of, of what I've done. Um, so actually, let me tell you a little bit of the story behind the documentary. So um, in going back and forth to Tunisia um, for really, I've been going back and forth for the last 16 years, um, I had a good friend, Jamal, um, who had been sort of uh, talking about making a documentary for years. In Tunisia, the film industry is very, very big. And people who are musicians and artists um, quite often think that the way to prove their value in society is to make a film, to make a documentary. Um, and especially if they know someone from outside of the country, it's seen as being um, you know, a good idea to cut a documentary to serve describing their work. So my friend Jamel had been sort of asking and talking about um, the two of us making a documentary for years. I never really took it very seriously um, since he had lots of really big ideas um, until one day, it was almost exactly 10 years ago, I was in uh, the capital Tunis and hanging out at a coffee shop and Jamel said, today's the day, we're gonna start our documentary. And lo and behold, um, we had a film crew show up and we had some of our mutual friends show up and we began five days of filming. I was completely blown away. I did not think um, it was real. Um, so he had a script in mind, you know, he had some scenes in mind and um, we started working on this documentary. So I'm going to show you just a little bit and then I'm going to tell you more about the project. So I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that the screen share works. I know we tested this already, but uh, we'll give it a try. And um, I have this open and screen share. Okay, sound is on. There we go. I think is a very beautiful thing that we can have a heritage which is so rich um, and so complex that there are all these little pieces, all these little threads, and I feel it's my job to collect all of these. Um, and I don't make any judgment, I don't know what the answer is, but it's fascinating talking to people and finding out what all the possibilities are. Central to Alan's research has been the friendship he has formed with Jamel, a trained musician and Gumbri master whom he met by chance one day. 
Jamal is passionate about preserving the rich tradition of Stambeli, but he is also interested in allowing it to merge with other genres of world music. I was studying at the Borgiva School, and one day I was wandering through the Medina and I got lost. Um, it was in the afternoon and I heard some music, so I looked down one of the alleyways and I saw Jamel sitting, smoking shisha, and I heard some music. So I turned into the alley and I introduced myself to Jamel and I asked him about music. Um, he told me it was Hadra, that it was a production by Fadel Jaziri. And I asked him more questions, and he explained everything to me. And um, after about an hour, um, we found we had become friends. This leads to several visits to the Medina. Okay, so you get a little taste of what this documentary is, is like. So the, the filming continued for these five days, and then I returned about six months later and continued. And then uh, Jamel came to the U.S. and we continued filming. So after about a year, year and a half, we had um, enough raw footage for a documentary. And my friend Jamel said, yes, Alan, I can you know, take all this and I can have it mastered and edited and we can have a documentary. Will not be a problem. You know, we have funding. You know, all you need to do is show up. So we did, and um, after a while, um, I, I heard back from Jamel and said, Alan, we have a bit of a problem. Funding has fallen through. I can't find anyone to finish this. You have to finish this documentary. I said, I can't. I, have, I know nothing about film. I know nothing about editing. I know nothing about putting this together. I can't. And he just presented me with a hard drive with all the materials and said, Alan, you have to finish it. So um, I brought the hard disk back to the U.S. and I started looking for people to help. I, you know, asked for colleagues who had, had done documentaries already. Um, I applied for grants. Um, I did everything imaginable. I took about five years trying to take all this raw footage and make it into a real documentary. Um, I'd applied for about 25 grants in the end. Every single one got declined. I um, asked colleagues for help. Everyone said, Alan, it's just, this is too much work. We cannot help you. I tried everything imaginable. And finally, you know, Jamel kept on pressuring me, said, Alan, we have to get this done. You know, I need this for my own work. And finally I had to say, Jamel, I have failed. I can't do this. I haven't gotten, I have not gotten any funding to get help for this. No one is willing to do it. I even tried to pay people to do it. And no one was willing to take on the work. So um, I felt terrible. I felt terrible letting Jamel down. I felt uh, professionally as if I was a failure because here is a project I was trying to embark on and um, I could not make it work. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things that I took away from this is that um, I need to talk about this failure that um, here, you know, not only did I let myself down, I let Jamel down. Um, I had started telling people professionally that I was making a documentary. Um, I turned them down. And this gave me an opportunity to reflect on, on other failures. So um, um, for my second master's degree, um, I was doing a, a degree in music history and um, I had started on my master's thesis and about halfway through the process, my advisor decided to retire. I did not think this was a tragedy um, and uh, my advisor said, we'll find another advisor for you. It won't be a problem. So um, we did find another advisor for me and I started working with Professor Stanley um, and he was very, very smart and he was a great guy. And he turned to me and said, Alan, your, your thesis, it will not work. You have to start all over again. Um, so I shed some tears, I, I screamed a little bit. Um, and then I said, you know what? I'm gonna finish my degree. I just have to carry on. So we started looking at new topics. I started writing again. I started submitting chapters to Professor Stanley. And um, after I started submitting chapters to him, he said, Alan, this will not work. He said, your organization is terrible. Your writing is terrible. Um, you need to start all over yet again. 
So um, I didn't know quite what to do. Um, everything I had tried, um, it did not work. Professor Stanley could not tell me what exactly he was looking for. All he could say was, um, Alan, this is all wrong. So I kept on writing. I reached out to some colleagues. I, I reached out to um, some other music historians and um, asked for some advice. And I came up with lots of different versions of what I had written and sent it off to Professor Stanley. And finally, after a number of years, um, he said, Alan, you figured it out. Keep on going. So I did not anticipate that this master's degree was going to take about seven years to complete. Um, it was a bit painful, but finally in the end, I did it. It took lots of help from a variety of people. It took lots of perseverance. It took family as cheerleaders saying, Alan, you can't give up now, you have to keep on going. Um, so once I started thinking about um, these failures and thinking about this presentation and doing a little bit of academic uh, research and writing on failure, I reflected on some more of my own experiences, that I had written countless conference papers that never got accepted. I even wrote some journal articles that would never get published. Um, and then I reached out to yet another colleague, someone who's actually in the field of political science. And um, I asked um, my, my friend David um, about his experience with failure. Um, and he pointed to the walls in his office. The walls in his office were completely covered with rejection notices. Uh, rejection notices from graduate schools, from conferences, from uh, academic journals that would not publish his papers. Um, and he said, whenever a student comes in a little bit despondent, he points to the walls around him and how the, the walls are just covered within, with these rejection notices. Indeed, he had lots of successes. He was a tenured faculty member. Um, he actually got offered from other, offers from other universities to take positions there. Um, he had won lots of awards. He was a celebrated speaker. Um, so the moral of the story was is that even though he had a number of successes, the number of failures far surpassed the number of uh, the number of failures far surpassed the number of successes. Um, is it still painful? Yes, indeed. Very painful. But it was really interesting to hear that I was not alone, that I had my failures, my, my second um, master's thesis, um, you know, the documentary project, all the other failures. Um, so when I started thinking about this presentation in a paper that I'm writing um, alongside this about failure and successes, um, what I started to do is to do some reading regarding um, failure. And I'm happy to share with you, um, uh, I have a, an extensive bibliography on, uh, on successes and on failures. Um, and there's tons of literature on failure in various fields, whether it be a nursing or education or engineering, um, that lots of people talk about the nature of failure. Unfortunately, in, in undergraduate school and graduate school, no one, really no one really prepares you for what failure looks like or how to get ready for failure. Um, so what I'd like to do with you is I do have my slides. And if you give me just a moment, I'm going to get to my slides. And let's see, screen share. Um, and there are my slides. And uh, so in looking at the literature on failure, I was trying to see, you know, what could help me put my own failures in perspective? What lessons could I learn from them? And what do we need to know about failure in general in the academy or even professionally? And um, one of the authors who really sort of resonated me, with me was Brene Brown. Um, I don't know if, if you're familiar with Brene Brown. Um, she's uh, quite often, you know, in the media. She's now sort of known as a, a popular psychologist. Um, she's at the University of Texas at Austin, and she deals with lots of areas. She looks at um, failure, shame, um, you know, success, motivation, 
um, you know, any aspect of sort of being better in the academy and being better in the workforce. She has lots of really interesting books. They're really uplifting books. And um, whether you're, you're thinking about a career in education or just as a student yourself, it might be look, um, worthwhile looking through her books on um, resilience, failure, success. And she also have a, has a podcast, which is really interesting. Um, if you don't have time to, to add more reading to your list, even if you can spare a half an hour a week to listen to her, pro her podcast, they're really interesting. So um, there are a couple of books that I would like to draw from that um, I find really interesting. One of which is Dare to Lead um, from 2018. Um, and there is a quote in particular um, and a passage in particular that um, inspired me. Um, in, in thinking about leadership and failure and success, she says that we are not taught resiliency. People don't take risks. People don't take risks not only because they are afraid to fail, because they haven't been taught the resilient skills necessary to recover after a setback or failure. And I thought about my own education, and um, for me, that was very, very true. That no one talked about failure, no one talked about risk taking, and no one talked about resiliency. Um, you know, I wish at some point, whether high school or undergraduate school, you know, someone was just very honest and said, you know what, you have to take risks. Sometimes you're going to write a paper and it's not going to go very well. Um, sometimes you're going to think you're doing a really fabulous job writing a paper um, and your professor just won't get it. So the question is, based on, you know, this idea from Brene Brown, how do you move forward? And you know, what I have learned from my failed documentary project and a second um, master's thesis and um, other scholarly articles is sometimes you have to reach out to people and say, you know, you know what, I feel a little bit silly. I wrote this thing, um, whether it be a, a thesis chapter or a scholarly article, and it didn't get accepted. Um, maybe the, the critique of it was quite harsh. Um, Sometimes you have to put your tail between your legs and have a little bit of shame and feel bad for a little bit. Um, maybe you buy some, yourself some chocolate um, and, or a, uh, um, a pint of really nice ice cream and you drown your sorrows in ice cream for a little while. And then you ask yourself, okay, what didn't go right? Um, how can I improve this for next time? You know, maybe you reach out to a faculty member, maybe you reach out to a friend or a family member and say, hey, could you please read, it, read this for me um, and see what, what went wrong? Um, sometimes the criticism is hard to take, um, but just having the ability to um, get up, say, you know what, I'm gonna do better next time, that's, um, that's something that you get better at as time goes on. So I remember um, submitting a paper for a, a conference, um, again, maybe around 15 years ago. And the paper got accepted to the conference I presented, um, but then afterwards um, there was peer reviewed critique that other people at the conference were able to read my paper afterwards and submit feedback. My feedback was devastating. Um, it was just terrible. You know, the, all the, the submissions were ranked on a scale of zero to 100. And I think I got around to 31. But I learned a lot. You know, I, I, the first time I read the comments, um, it, was, it was just terrible. But afterwards, I said, you know what? What can I learn from this? And I learned a lot from it. Once I was able to brace myself and say, you know what? This will allow me to do better. Um, I read the comments and said, you know what? Not all of it is correct. But people did have some interesting things to say about my paper, and I can, I can learn from this. So one of the things I, I invite you to do when you think about successes and you think about failures is sometimes people will give you critique. Sometimes you might get a bad grade or a thesis chapter might be sent back to you. Um, but sometimes you can say to yourself, you know what, I believe in this, even though you know, this chapter or article might have been deemed a failure by one person. Let me take a step back, a critical look, and um, maybe it wasn't them. Um, you know, um, maybe it wasn't me. Maybe, maybe it was them. And maybe having a second set of eyes is a good thing. So um, I'm going to continue on with my lessons from Brene Brown. Um, in one of her other books, Rising Strong, 2015, um, in chapter nine, there's a case study of Andrew. 
a leader in the advertising industry who moves on after a devastating failure. So how does he do this? A, he talks about it with a colleague. So having someone who's familiar with what you do, or at least is willing to listen, and just to talk about what happened what your failure looked like, um, how it made you feel. You know, just an opportunity to have someone listen objectively, give you support, um, and um, just for you to vent a little bit. So um, the second part of this is being honest about the failure. Was it a failure? Could you have done better? Did you miss something? Maybe the writing wasn't your best. Or maybe um, maybe you can say, you know what? This was not about me. This was about the reader. Maybe you felt your, your professor was unnecessarily harsh. Um, maybe if it was a conference, you know, maybe the conference presenter, or the, the conference organizer was looking for someone else. So talking about it, being honest about what happened. And C, moving on. So one of the things that Brene Brown talks about, and I think it's really, really important, is this idea that at some point, after we've had a failure, things haven't gone as we expected, that we do move on. Sometimes we revise what we've done and we resubmit. Sometimes we just look at what we've done and say, you know what, this isn't going to work. I'm just going to move on. So I remember a chapter of my doctoral dissertation that I wrote, and I was so incredibly proud of it. Um, it was a chapter on gift giving amongst musicians in Tunisia. Um, I referenced the literature. I thought my writing was just impeccable. Um, I was really proud of it. It was the right word length. My chapter was around you know, 40 pages. I thought I really nailed it. So I sent it to my advisors and they read it. And they said, you know what, Alan? This is excellent. However, it's not gonna work because it really has nothing to do with the, the greater topic of your dissertation. And um, I was upset. You know, I said, this is inf incredible work. I'm really, really proud of this. And um, I heard what they had to say. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna hang on to this. I'm gonna publish it at some point. I'm gonna use it for something else. It just doesn't fit right here. So um, I was able to move on. Um, I was able to accept what worked. It was good writing, it was good research, it was well done. I was also able to accept what didn't work. It did not fit into my project. So I carried on, you know, it was a partial success, a partial failure, failure. I kept the chapter, I still have it on some point, I will use it. And I also will also know that the writing was good. The research was good, that my advisors approved of it. It's just the wrong place at the wrong time. So going back to Brene Brown one more time. So rising strong. So once on um, this case study of Andrew, once he could admit what, what, what went wrong and what he learned, he could get back to work. He felt shame. He felt guilt. He felt disappointment, but he had resiliency skills. So this was the ability to, to carry on, say, you know what, this didn't work. It was the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong place. And um, he kept on going. So there are lots of other uh, examples from Brene Brown about um, resiliency and failure and shame. Um, but fundamentally, she talks about our ability to move on. So in, in higher education, one of the other ways we talk about it we, is we talk about grit, um, the ability to keep on going. Um, sometimes it has to do with failures. Sometimes it has to do with disappointments. Um, sometimes it has to do with our own headspace, how we feel about what we're doing. You know, all of us have personal lives. There are um, families to tend with, um, significant others, you know, boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives, sometimes children. Um, you have mortgage to pay, bills to pay, student loans to pay. Um, so there's so much going on in our lives and the ability to focus, to overcome disappointments. It's sometimes really, really difficult. Um, so the idea behind grit is perseverance, continuing on, giving yourself credit for what you've done, but also realizing that we all have work to do. So my slide, what do we do about failure? We take risks, we practice failure, we keep track of what we've learned through the experience and we get back to work. So there are people who will decide, you know what, it is time 
to give up on a project. Um, and I had a good friend who's a music historian. Um, he had published, um, but he never finished his doctoral dissertation. And at some point he decided, you know what? I, I don't need to pursue this anymore. He said, I accomplished what I needed to. He said, I got a good job in higher education, not doing, not, not teaching, but doing research. And actually as a librarian, he had published, he had learned a lot and he said, you know what? I'm not going to finish the dissertation and it's okay. For some people, it just takes longer than you think. Um, and other people, it's just a little bit more painful. Um, but again, take risks, practice failure, keep track of what you've learned and keep on going. So this practice is something that we have to do on a regular basis. We have to take risks on a regular basis. We have to practice failure on a regular basis. We have to talk to our friends and colleagues about what we've done. This is really important. If we don't talk to people about all the challenges, we can often feel isolated and people don't talk about this. Um, so talk to your fellow graduate students, talk to friends and family, talk to professors about the challenges. They will completely understand because they've been here before of the frustrations of writing, of writing blocks, of um, chapters that haven't gone the way you thought about, um, homework assignments that haven't gone quite well, even entire classes that haven't gone well. Talk to faculty members about what your frustrations are. And just the sheer fact of talking about it and admitting what hasn't gone well will empower you to keep on going. Um, so one of the things that I think we need to change in higher education is to change the way we talk about failure and to normalize it a little bit, to have faculty members talk about when things don't go well for them. Uh, a lot of faculty members, you know, don't talk about their failures openly um, and students don't ask about it. You know, we don't have this dialogue in the classroom about when things don't go well and how we recover. So I think we all need to talk about this more. Um, so here is my, my link to my failure bibliography. Um, so it's a bit.ly link, it'll take you to um, a bibliography. And again, this covers lots of different disciplines, um, writings by Brene Brown on uh, shame, resilience, um, lots of other discussions about um, failure in nursing, medicine, education, art. There's some interesting art books that talk about failure. You know, what happens when you're, you're trying to create that perfect sculpture or painting and it doesn't go well. And I'm always happy to get uh, more feedback on, on uh, you know, on this talk and on the bibliography if you've encountered some interesting readings on, on failure or resilience or grit, please do let me know. So we have a little bit of time. I'm going to open the floor up for um, questions, comments, or, or anything. And you can use the chat as well if you don't want to um, turn on your microphone. So um, hi. Go ahead. <laughs> My name is Kizzy, and um, I have a seven-year-old. He's I, I don't know where he gets this from, but um, he's like um, a perfectionist. I try to teach him that there's no part in failure because I've learned as a lot of the things that you were saying. Do you know of any resources available for teaching um, younger people, not necessarily seven-year-olds, but younger people in general about how to accept failure and use those things to move on and um, be great? I think you're getting weird feedback again, Dr. Crest. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. So um, Kizzy, thank you very, very much for your question. So um, yeah, you know, I, I think there are lots of, of kids who, you know, for whatever reason, you know, maybe it's in their genes, um, they are perfectionists. And um, what I will do, uh, what I will do, Kizzy, um, what I will do, Kizzy, is um, I will, I'll do a little bit of digging and um, I will send you an email and um, I will share with you what I have found. Um, that's really interesting. Um, I would 
I, I, my guess is that you could just model model the behavior. Um, you know, if he's if if um, you know your child is perfectionist, that that might be just something that they're going to have to sort of um, you know eventually grow out of and, and and deal with. But let me see what resources I can find, and I will send them your way. <clears throat> Not just for and my son. I'm also an assistant principal, and I have ah. a it's um, a lot of. It's either one or two mindsets. I have my older teachers who are afraid to do things because they're, I've done it so many ways, but it's really a fear of failure and yeah, not being yeah. known. And yeah. then I have a set of young teachers at my school that want to be perfect. Like I just got into this and I guess they think that, you know, they're going to get fired in two days if they yeah. don't do something correctly. And so I yep. want them to take academic risk with the students, try different things because we bring the yeah. young people in to keep us, you know, on edge about the new things that's going on. And then they, you know, they don't want to share out because they're like, well, what if this is dumb? What if this doesn't work? But I'm like, you know what? It, it yeah. may not. And so um, just some resources that I can mm -hmm. use maybe as a, um, to do a professional development with my staff on, you know, next year, let's yep. take some risks and let's not be so afraid of failing because it'll happen. And if it does, that's just an opportunity for us to revise our plan and, and continue moving forward. I love this, Kizzy. Um, so I actually went to a conference several years ago, and let me see if I can find the readings from that. It, it was um, actually an education conference. Um, and uh, the whole discussion, it was a two hour discussion on failure in the classroom. Um, so here at CSU, I have a, sa a staff of 26. Um, and, you know, ranging from, you know, seasoned, you know, professionals to people who are, you know, younger in the workforce. And it is something that we talk about all the time is having permission to fail. Um, so we, we have weekly staff meetings and I invite my staff, I said, it, it's okay to fail, that we actually learn more from failure than from success. Um, you know, we need to contain the failure. Um, you know, we can't, you know, do anything that really is, um, you know, detrimental to, to CSU, but we can experiment with things. We can do controlled failures. Um, you know, one of the things we're embarking on now is we're trying to experiment with, um, you know, lending out mobile hots, hotspots for students, faculty, and staff who are having, you know, connectivity issues. So if they need to do work from home and they can't because they don't have Wi-Fi, so we're trying to lend out mobile hotspots. Um, might it work? It might. We don't know. Um, right now, there hasn't been a whole lot of interest, um, but we are, we're trying. Um, if it fails, I know I explained to my staff what happens if this fails. What's, what is the failure involved? Well, we've invested, you know, a couple thousand dollars into making, making this work. If this fails and we have to abandon the project, the worst case that happens is a couple thousand dollars um, has been wasted. Is that terrible? It's not great. However, you know, it counterbalances. If we had succeeded, it really would have been amazing. So what are the things we're looking at? We have a social media campaign associated with this, that we post the fact that we have mobile hotspots available on, um, on Instagram and on Facebook and through email. So we, we have these things that sort of we're looking at a point of reference. What could we have done better? What are we doing? So um, in a classroom, you know, working with students. So I teach as well, um, you know, since my background is music, I, I teach um, music related classes here at, at um, CSU. And um, sometimes I do some radical things um, and some things go very, very well. Some things don't go well. Um, and for those things that go well, um, I take them and I pass them along to the next class I teach. For those things that don't go well, I'll talk to colleagues. Um, so I tell all of my, my staff and faculty, I said, take risks. It is completely okay. I'm more likely to be upset if we don't take risks, 
than if we do take risks. I'd be thrilled um, if people fail and say, we've learned something. You know, I went into a classroom and I tried to teach um, how to use academic resources and I failed miserably. If I can walk away and say, you know what, I've learned about what students need to learn um, to learn, then, um, you know, I, I've, I've learned something and it'll be better next time. So it's really hard. I, I feel your pain, Kizzy. I know it's really, really difficult, but I think all you can do is just be persistent and, um, you know, applaud people um, who, who do take a risk. And when things, you know, don't go well, say, you know, thank you. Thank you very much. You tried something. It did not work. This is a fabulous work, learning experience and celebrate their failure. You can even have a failure party, bring in golden donuts, you know, when, when someone has a failure and say, thank you, thank you for failing. You know, we've learned something about what doesn't work in the classroom and it's, it's okay. Um, but it's really hard, you know, um, in higher education in our society, you know, we look at, um, you know, the, the professional athletes who get millions and millions of dollars to be perfectionists. You know, we look at Tom Brady, um, who um, is aging, he gets paid millions of dollars, he has a trophy wife, um, and he just keeps on going. You know, there's not, not much room for failure. Um, you know, all of the, the athletic role models, you know, they're put on pedestals for, you know, being star athletes. Um, we don't celebrate our failure athletes. Um, all of our cultural icons we have, they, they all get celebrated. Um, so we have to try to break that mold and within our classrooms, within our schools, we have to highlight the value of, of learning through failure. It is not something that we hear about on a regular basis, but I'm embracing it in, and um, you know, I, I advise you to try to embrace it as well, despite how painful it is. But I'll, I'll see if I can find the, the literature. I'll, I'll pass it along. We have a question from Adela in the chat. Okay. Um, Adela, th thank you very, very much for your question. Um, so um, I I'm sorry to hear this. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so Adela, so let me share with you a related story. Um, so my brother-in-law is an architect. And he finished his master's degree and he went for the, the architecture licensing exam um, seven times and he failed seven times. Um, he knew he was going to be an architect. It was just a matter of, of passing the exam. Um, so what he did is he actually went to a, um, a psychologist who actually specialized in standardized tests. And um, they had a couple discussions about, um, about the psychology of taking a test and you know, what were his challenges and how could he prepare better, both psychologically and um, you know, academically for the test. Um, and it took two more attempts before he actually passed, but he did pass. So part of it was sort of looking at himself and looking at his own expectations. So part of it was looking at um, test taking strategies um, and part of it was just perseverance. So um, Adela, I think you can pass the exam. I think you can pass the certification test. Um, I think you can do it, but it might be worthwhile talking to someone who knows the test and um, maybe uh, someone who's a psychologist who, who understands the psychology of, of licensing exams and uh, certification exams and maybe helping with some strategies for what they're looking for. Um, so my, my brother-in-law, you know, he found this really, really helpful. And part of it is he was um, studying the wrong way. He was studying the wrong things. He was providing wrong answers. His interpretations of questions, it was not what the certifying board wanted to see from him. So um, I, I actually, my, my acupuncturist um, had the same thing happen. So he got his master's in acupuncture and he failed um, the exam many, many times. Um, and he did something similar. He actually reached out to a study group 
Um, so they meet on a weekly basis and they all help each other prepare for the exam. Um, and he was able to succeed just the sheer fact that he could meet with people who were also studying for the exam and they all shared strategies. And um, they also got some insights from, from people who were administering the, the exam onto what they're looking for. So um, uh, Adela, I, I think you can pass this. I think you can do this. But I think reaching out to people who are um, knowledgeable of the exam and knowledgeable on test taking strategies might be the, the way to go. So I hope that helps, Adela. Any other questions for Dr. Karaz? Feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. You're welcome, Adela. I wish you luck and truly reach out. I think you're getting the phantom echo again, Dr. Rest. Okay. So if we have no further questions, thank you for showing up to this session. You can use the breakout room button at the bottom to move to your next room if it's not here in room number two for the last session of the day. Thank you, Dr. Karras. That was very informative. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate your help and your patience as well. You're welcome.